We are in this study, we're calling it Crazy World Good God. You don't have to be a Christian to think the world's crazy, right? Everybody agrees the world is crazy. In fact, all it takes is to have internet service, right? You got internet, you know the world's crazy. The question is, what is the solution to the craziness of this world? And so we've t entitled the study of 1 Peter, Crazy World Good God. Because it's nothing unique that the world's crazy. It's that we need to understand the goodness of God in the midst of a crazy world. And this book is really a great book for us because what it takes is Peter is speaking to, to God's people who are living in the Roman Empire, which was the greatest economic and military powerhouse on the earth at that time. And yet it was, it was starting to wane. It had all of these different religions, all of these different views, all these different people groups because they had conquered such a vast territory. And in time, all those people groups and all those different ideologies and all those different theologies and all these different things started to fight one another. And so the Roman Empire really started to be pulled apart because everyone had a different way of viewing or looking at how people should live in the empire. And so one thing that in time they agreed with was their unique displeasure with Christians, this new movement of Christians, right? And so there's a lot of similarities that we can find between the book of First and Second Peter and our own situation. But God was giving them a word from, Peter was giving a word from God so that they would understand with clarity how to live for this good God, how to follow this good God in a crazy world, that we need that same word. And because the word of God is living and active, it's not as though this is his, just some kind of ancient book or historical book where it was simply what was happening with that person or those people. And in that context, it's what always happens. That's the idea behind the word of God being living and active is that it's always relevant and it's always just what we need to understand in order to follow God in any culture or context that we might find ourselves. And so uh, we're going to talk today, continuing really what we started in chapter 2. We're going to be dealing in chapter 3. So if you want to turn to First Peter in chapter 3, today we're going to be dealing with honor in marriage. Honor in marriage. And the verses that we're going to deal with today are really controversial in Christianity today. They're not controversial because they're hard to understand. They're not controversial because we don't have a, a, a long history, a track record of understanding these verses in a certain way. They're simply very controversial because we don't like what they say to us today. Like a lot of the Bible, it becomes very controversial and more controversial as we move forward, right? Because the more that the culture is different from the commands of God, the more that the commands and directives of God seem so far-fetched or so backwards compared to what we hear all the time in culture. But what is, this, this is a timeless word from God. This is always how God operates. This is what God says to his people in all times. And so while everybody in the world, in fact, everybody in Peter's time as well, was looking for their utopia, they all had different ideas on how to, be, how to get to that utopia. And one thing that you find, just like in our day, is everybody's looking for that utopia, but no one wants Jesus. Everyone wants everything squared away, and everyone wants a peaceful world, and everyone wants everyone to dwell in unity and harmony, and everyone to get along, and everyone wants prosperity, and everyone wants everyone healthy, and everyone wants these things, but nobody wants Jesus. But what you find in the scriptures is one day when Jesus rules and reigns over all of mankind, everything will finally dwell in peace and all of humanity will dwell as one big family and they will love God and they'll love their neighbor as themselves, right? But that's not how it is this side of Jesus' return. And so we're going to look at, we started last week, in fact, with this idea of coming under authorities. And we said last week, we're to come under governmental authorities and authorities in business, our managers, our bosses, right? And so you have the world that was, many people were freaking out under the last administration in this country, and now a lot of people are freaking out under this administration in this country. But as Christians, we simply look at it and we say, we pray for our leaders, right? We acknowledge God's sovereignty in who ultimately is elected to, whether it's the mayor, governor, president, whatever, and we recognize that God reigns supreme and sovereign over the affairs of mankind, and that he's actually involved in the affairs of mankind. So we honor those in authority over us, and we pray for them. 
And that's true not only in the political realm, which God has established. It's true in the realm of business, which also is as another realm of authority or today in the authority within the home. And so we're going to talk about honor in marriage. And this is completely different than our culture, which either tends to be chauvinistic or feminist, right? We tend to swing from a chauvinist society to a feminist society, but we never seem to land on following Christ. But honor in marriage, really, with a wife honoring her husband and a husband honoring his wife, really comes back to following what Jesus said. And so this idea started back in chapter 2, and it carries all the way through chapter 3. And it's the idea of honoring those in authority over you, as well as we'll see today, honoring those under your authority as well. But first, let's review. We said in the first, the first week that in your difficulty, find your blessings, right? In difficulties, find blessings. Because if you're truly a child of God, then you have infinite and limitless blessings in Christ, even in the darkest, most difficult days of your life. Because the promises of God are not merely for the here and now. The promises of a God are for eternity. That literally, 6,000 years from now, you're going to be looking back and they're going to say, Man, remember those difficulties you had when you were on earth? And you're going to be like, man, you're going to be like thinking like it was as if you could remember your October of your second grade year right now. You're like, no, I don't even remember that. You're, you're not even going to remember these things. Because the promises of God go on and on and on forever for God's people. That he is with us and near us. That he has planned, a, that he has a future for us. That we are inheritors with him of the universe. That all of these things, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. We need to, in our difficulty, find our blessings. Second, we, see, we said we need to rebel. That is, we need to rebel against the demonic philosophies of this world, just as we study in Daniel, the spirit of Daniel, that demonic spirit that, that was really driving the culture is alive and well in our culture today. And so there's all kinds of demonic lies and philosophies that simply lead to the destruction of mankind. And we need to rebel against these demonic philosophies and these mob mentalities within culture. But we also need to rebel against our own sinful inclination to go after our own fleshly lust and rebel against those things that were even handed down from our forefathers. Those things that were patterns through our family or through our religious tradition that don't fit with what Jesus is calling us to. So then we looked at be healthy and proclaim loudly. Remember, we said that we're to feed on God's word. He says like a baby longs for milk. And that we're not to allow in our diet malice and envy and strife. All these things that will are a quick route, a shortcut to being spiritually sick. So we're to, we're to put aside all those things. Many of those things are really what social media is all about, right? And instead, we're to feed on the pure word of God so that we would go out and proclaim his excellency. So we're to be healthy spiritually. So we're to proclaim loudly about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then last week we said Jesus. And we talked about Jesus, justice, and authority. And we talked about these things that God is for justice. God is for doing the right thing. God is for us coming under the authorities God places over us. And those authorities are not always very good, right? And yet, God says that he will essentially draw a straight line with a crooked stick, right? That is, God is still for us, no matter what authorities he places over us, that part of relating to God is relating appropriately to the authorities he's placed in our life and trusting that he's still going to draw a straight line for us, even when the authority is not what they should be. And so that leads us to chapter 3 in the book of 1 Peter, and that's really honor in marriage. And so we live in a day where there's many failed marriages and many dysfunctional marriages, and marriages that don't honor one another and not marriages that don't honor God. And it's critical that we understand how we're to live and how we're to do marriage so that we can honor one another and so that we can honor God. And we certainly live, we, like I said, we tend to have either chauvinist or feminist society, right? We tend to swing one way or the other. Lately, feminism is a, a big part of our culture. And so... Uh, it runs the gamut as far as what we mean by feminism, right? But it can mean that, hey, he makes $25 an hour. I should make $25 an hour, right? He can go to combat. I should be able to go into combat. If he's not expected to stay home and raise kids, I shouldn't be expected to stay home and raise kids. He doesn't have to wear a shirt or a bra. I don't have to, right? I mean, it starts to go in a lot of different directions on this, right? Feminism. And so while our culture seems to be immersed in feminism, and it's certainly 
in many cultures. In fact, our own culture has been immersed in chauvinism as well. And in many ways, you have the duality of chauvinism, whether you have these domineering men who are jerks and don't care about anything but themselves and don't care about anyone's ideas but their own and don't want to listen or have empathy for anyone. We're not talking about chauvinism or feminism. We're talking about how to honor the Lord with our marriages. That is, that as God's people, our marriage is to be a reflection of the gospel. Our marriages should lead us to honoring one another in such a way that we have happy, fruitful, effective marriages that put on display the gospel, that bring glory to God, that people look at it. Even if they don't like Jesus, they say, man, I mean, I like Jesus, but I like that marriage. That's amazing. If I, I, why, why does this work? It, well, it's not because there's these set of principles that apart from Christ that you just Hey, I, you can be happy. It's that as you follow Christ, you learn to honor one another and your marriage becomes a reflection of God's original design. And God alone, by the way, is the one, since he's the creator, he's the only one that has the blueprint for success in this life. And so if you don't follow these things, you don't live in a way, according to God's word, to honor one another in your marriage, then your marriage will be in a process of dying and coming apart, right? And instead of honor, you will have contempt. And you've probably all seen that. And, and the opposite of honoring is contempt. That is, you despise your spouse. And, and you can see it in their face, right? They despise what their spouse is about. So when you get to the point in your marriage where you despise the other person, you are looking at all the things they do wrong, and you're saying, I cannot even stand this person, right? It's the opposite of honor. Because honor can also be seen in our face. Honor is that sense where you're looking at all the things that they do right to despise them. You look at all the things they do wrong, right? The despising of a spouse is found that you find all the worst things about your spouse, whereas honoring is focusing on the best things about your spouse. But here's what he says in chapter 3. And just so you know, I reiterate this on some, sort of these passages like this, right? I didn't write this. I'm just the mailman, right? So in case you don't shoot your mailman for the mail he brings, it gives you an idea. You don't have to, uh, you know, I didn't write this. This is what he's saying. Chapter 3, verse 1. In the same way, you wives be submissive yeah, to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. And so you read this in certain circles in our culture, and, and they would run you out of there on the rail, right? Because if it's not offensive enough to think I need to submit to political leaders that I don't like, or that I need to submit to a boss that I clearly don't agree with, then how much more offensive it is to encourage a wife to submit to a husband even a husband who is disobedient to the word. That term disobedient to the word is used elsewhere in this book to describe an unbeliever because according to chapter 1 verse 2, <clears throat> believers are pictured by their obedience. According to the foreknowledge of chapter 1 verse 2 of God the Father by the sanctifying word of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ. So a believer is marked by obedience Whereas unbelievers are marked by disobedience. So he may have in mind also, and certainly could be, the, the idea that this is simply a believer who is being disobedient to the word. Or he may have in mind an unbeliever, that she's married to an unbeliever. And also in chapter 2, verse 8, we, we had read, And a stone of stumbling and a, block, a rock of offense, for they stumbled because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they are appointed. So clearly throughout the Bible, throughout this book, I should say, they are using this term disobedient as someone who is an unbeliever. But I think it also applies to simply a disobedient Christian husband. But you ask, how does a Christian lady end up with an unbelieving husband? There's many ways to do that, right? Some will get married and then come to saving faith in Christ and they find themselves married to an unbeliever. Some will go against the word of God and sort of missionary date. They go date an unbeliever. They fall in love with the unbeliever. They get married to the unbeliever. And then in time realize that's a tough spot, right? Because really you're building on two different foundations. The believer says, I love Jesus. I respect Jesus. The final authority is the word of God. The unbeliever doesn't believe any of that. For the unbeliever, they're saying, I love my life. 
you fit in my life because I love my life and this works well for my life. They're not acknowledging the authority of the word of God as, as the supreme authority. And, and, and so it becomes two different foundations and it becomes very difficult in marriage. And so you need to recognize if you're a believer, you're not to marry an unbeliever. The scriptures are very clear about that because you're building a marriage on two different foundations. And so this is a t- difficult situation. He says, in the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands. So we're not just talking about men in general. Women aren't supposed to be submissive to men in general. We're talking a wife to a husband, just as we talked about what? Submitting to political authorities. We're not saying that the political authorities, we're submitting to them because they're smarter and better and all these things. They're simply, by God's design, a structure to this universe. There's a structure to the authorities that God has placed, including in this the civil authorities, including in business, including in the home. And so these structures that God put in place, when we look at that and we say, I'm going to honor and by faith submit to the structures that God puts in place, it pleases God, doesn't it? And it keeps us from ultimately disintegrating. And a lot of marriages end up just fighting. And um, In fact, he says, in the same way, be submissive to your own husband. So even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word by the behavior of the wives. Now, what is the natural response when your husband is not doing what he should do? You want to tell him, right? And the natural response to a husband that is not doing what he should do to a wife that's nagging him is what? Just keep going, right? Just keeps adding fuel to the fire. He gets more frustrated. She gets more frustrated. Before long, it's kind of like a chihuahua just barking at him, right? And he's just going, I'm just ignoring her altogether. And what happens is marriages disintegrate. You know what the opposite of preaching at a husband is? And the very difficult act of faith is, is to say, I'm just going to trust that God is going to deal with him. And instead of interjecting yourself between Jesus and the husband, what you want to do is leave room for the Holy Spirit to bring conviction and to bring him to repentance. And so what you need to do is say, man, well, how does God's spirit bring conviction to a wayward husband? Which, by the way, when a spouse goes wayward, which spouse is it that usually goes wayward? More often than not, it's the husband, right? If anyone shanks away from walking by faith, going back to these old ways, that's why the church is typically like 60% of, uh, of people who go to church are ladies, right? A lot more often it's the men who go wayward than the ladies that go wayward. But he says this is a tough situation, right? That, and you would have to have extreme faith to say, man, I'm going to trust the Lord and not put myself in between him and Jesus. I'm going to simply model godly character. That's very difficult to do, isn't it? And yet this is what the Holy Spirit prompts us to do. And so instead of getting into a fight and what happens is when one spouse is not walking with the lord a lot of times there can be arguments right and you get drawn into arguments and before long you end, you're in this death spiral where you're just fighting and arguing and and growing in dishonor and disgust for one another rather than honoring one another so he says as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior so the most powerful thing a wife has is her testimony even though a lot of times we think that it's through our words. That's not to say that as a godly wife should bring up her godly concerns, right? She should be bringing up her godly concerns to her husband. But then that needs to happen in a way that recognizes the, the very real danger. This thing can disintegrate, go south, blow up very quickly. And that her primary power is in her testimony and God's spirit is primarily going to use her testimony of her walking as a godly woman to convict her wayward husband to actually start doing the right thing and he says he goes into it because this is a difficult thing so he says your adornment must not be merely external braiding the hair the wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses notice he says is not to be merely that, right? Is he saying that you can't have jewelry or braided hair or putting on pretty dresses? No, it's not a command like, oh man, you want to be godly, be frumpy, right? That's not it. He's saying that, that the primary focus for the lady is what? A heart that's being trained to love the Lord and follow the Lord. And the other things 
are, are really down the list of priorities, aren't they? Nothing wrong with braided hair, nothing wrong with jewelry, all these things. But godliness is the greatest thing. It's to be the primary thing. He says, but let, the, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. And so while in this world, not everyone is born with natural beauty, right? In this world, not everyone has the same opportunity to be wealthy and be able to buy all of these things. But everyone has the opportunity. All ladies have the opportunity, what? To have the greatest quality of all. That is the gentle and quiet spirit that trusts in and relies upon the Lord. And our culture says just the opposite, right? Our culture tends to say, man, not that women with a quiet and gentle spirit are precious, but rather women with a take charge, kick butt attitude, that's where we value and esteem them, right? That's why you have more and more the, the action figures are scantily dressed women kicking butt and taking names, right? And, and then we try to, on the guy side, we try to continue to feminize the men, right? So you have glee and these things, you're trying to feminize the men and masculinize the women. Because really what we're saying is we want, we want a utopian society, but we don't want Jesus. We actually are saying we want everything to go well and we want everything to be happy and peaceful, but we don't want to do it God's way. We're going to do it our way. And so he's saying far be it from that. God looks at things. God sees our attitudes. God sees what's going on. There are things that bring God pleasure that God smiles on and says, man, I like that. I love that. And things that God rewards. And he's talking specifically on how a, a wife honors her husband. We'll deal with husbands in just a minute. But he says, this is precious in the sight of God. And some say, well, you know, I grew up in a home where I didn't learn quiet and gentle. In fact, I grew up in, in, a, you know, in a setting where we value and esteem being loud and brash. Or maybe you say, well, my husband likes me to be, be loud and somewhat abrasive. And you say, well, he, didn't, he just needs to read the Bible too, right? You need to read the Bible. He needs to read the Bible. You need to believe what the Bible says, right? Neither of you believe the Bible, apparently. So... For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. So this isn't a new thing. This is just always the thing with God. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, it's interesting he points out Sarah, right? Because in reality, you would be hard pressed to find a worse example in the scriptures of somebody who by faith followed the Lord than Sarah, right? I mean, you just think about it. Sarah, God comes and makes a promise. You're going to have a child. What does she do? Worship, thank the Lord. No, she does what? She laughs, doesn't believe that's true, comes with her own plan. Here's her plan. I'm going to go help my husband get a girlfriend, encourage my husband to get his girlfriend pregnant. This is a good plan. Does that sound like a bad plan? If it sounds like a bad plan to you, it's because it's a bad plan, right? Sarah might have been the example in Hebrews 11 of, yes, she had faith, but we should be encouraged because her faith was very frail like our own right she grew in faith so that ultimately in hebrews 11 where she's commended is for believing that god would provide the answer to this thing that originally she laughed at and ultimately came with a completely different plan and yet god says man look at sarah because she's a great example of what i'm talking about so we clearly see that in the bible god is not dealing with perfect people God is dealing with people who have faith in God amidst all kinds of struggles to believe God, right? And so there's something endearing about Sarah. It's unbelievable in some regard that she makes the list of the great heroes of the faith, like Samson, the womanizer. The only thing you could possibly find in Samson's life that he actually didn't screw up was the fact that he believed God had put him there to take out the Philistines, and he carried that out. Because every other thing that God commanded him he simply disregarded and did the opposite. And yet he makes the list of heroes of the faith. So you and I can be encouraged. We can be encouraged to say, man, I need to be believing God. If I'm struggling to believe God, I need to ask God to help me believe him. We can look back not at a track record of all these perfect people. We look back at a track record of all these messed up people and this perfect God who still loves us, patiently deals with us, and helps us to trust him and even celebrates when we do trust him, even though he was the one that gave us faith and helped us to trust him. And so what we're saying is these things, how does a wife honor her husband so as to produce a marriage that glorifies God 
and is an example of what God is talking about. This is how you do that, right? Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. What you'll find is a lot of ladies deal with a lot of fears, right? A lot of ladies deal with a lot of fears. And if they have a disobedient husband, then they have all kinds of more fears. And yet he's saying, you don't have to be frightened by any of these fears. You just need to trust that I'm in control even of your dud husband, right? Because that's what you feel like when your husband is disobedient to the word. You say, this guy's a dud. And then you look to Christ and you go, no. God is in control of this situation. I can trust him. I don't have to fear and I don't have to worry. I don't have to fret and I don't have to preach. I have to trust. The issue is I need to trust Jesus Christ. And then he moves on to verse 7 where he deals with husbands. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. That is, empathizing with them, right? As with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Again, all of these passages are super offensive, right? In fact, when you talk about being the weaker vessel, we say, oh, that's garbage. I mean, we just, what, two weeks ago? made a federal mandate that biological men can compete with women in collegiate sports, college sports, high school sports. It's pretty amazing in a day where feminism is, where there's many things that legitimately we fight to have rights for ladies, that now we have, what, gender, gender neutral bathrooms so men can pee on the toilet seats that women are using, uh, you know, and we also have biological men competing uh, against ladies in sports. And so there's been some lawsuits filed because they say, well, these guys are physically stronger than us. And you've just creamed us in regards to getting scholarships and winning, right? And they're right. And it is unfair to those ladies and it is not looking out for these ladies. But we have this radical commitment to sameness rather than to listening to Christ and following the word of God. But he says this, you husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so your prayers will not be hindered. Do you know there's no difference in value between men and women for God? There's no difference in, in, in God's valuing, in God's esteeming, in God's plan for men and women. It's just a difference that God made us different that God has different roles for us, that God has different equipping for us, that we're same before the cross of Christ. We're all equally valued in the eyes of God, equally created in the image of God, equally do we have the, 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 the calling of God in our lives. It's just that it's a different role. It's a different plan. It's a different equipping. And by celebrating the differences, we actually value and esteem and honor one another and celebrate our creator. And so... You husbands, the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. So this is to empathize with them. Now, granted, empathy is not typically men's strong suit, right? Because empathy is me putting myself in their place and understanding what they're dealing with. Typically, men are like, I understand what I understand. I, I see it my way. That's the only way that matters, right? In fact, I got a plan. I don't need to listen to your plan. I got a plan. I'm doing my plan, right? As men, empathy is not usually our strong suit. And yet he says, you want to honor your wife? Then you should empathize with them. So when we empathize with our wife, we look at our wife and we say, wow, what is it to be married to me? And then you go, ouch. Right? Man. Like we can empathize, you know, like if you think about some of the wives here. And we say, wow, we... We know your husbands. We're sorry. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I can dog the guys here on this. No, but when you think about being married to someone like yourself, we should have empathy, right? We should say, wow, that can't be the easiest go at life right there, right? We should be empathetic towards our wife. We should live with them in an understanding way. We should put ourselves in their shoes and say, man, what is my wife dealing with? Not only does she marry to me and have to put up with me, but man, is she... Is she stressed out from a job? Is she trying to care for a, a whole bunch of kids? Is she, you know, is she dealing with things with her extended family? I mean, what are the things that she's dealing with? I need to have empathy. I need to, to be able to stop, slow down, think about 
things from her perspective and then say, how can I help her? How can I encourage her? How can I lead her? How can I, how can I help her through this and love her and encourage her and wash her with the word? How can I be there to honor her and to value her and esteem her and to make sure that she understands that her inner beauty is way more important than her outer beauty and at the same time to encourage her that I value her and I see her as beautiful and that she is the, the mark and measure of beauty to me, right? All of these things are what a husband does to honor his wife and thereby honor the Lord, right? So you husbands in the same way. So it's a very similar, it's a different role between husbands and wife, but in a similar way, husbands are to honor the wife just as the wife is to honor the husband, right? And since she is a woman and show her the honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so your prayers will not be hindered. What he's saying is, that there are literally men who don't honor, they're not empathetic, they're not caring, kind, loving, they're not doing the work of Christ, they're not being a servant, loving servant leader to their wives, and God says, I don't even care what you pray about because I don't have any intention of listening to your prayers. Do you know that? So if you're like, man, this is so critical. Man, I need to, I need to pray, I need an answer from, from God, I need God to move in the situation. You don't need to go to the guy who's a jerk to his wife. Because his prayer won't help you. In fact, his prayer won't help him, right? Because God looks at his wife and says, that's my daughter. And you better handle her with great value because I value her greatly. You don't act towards my daughter in the way I expect. Then you can expect I'm not going to handle you in the way you want. And so to take a jerk husband who isn't empathetic, who isn't loving, who isn't kind, who isn't doing these things, and to say, pray for me, might as well have your dog pray for you, right? It's not going to help you. Because God doesn't value that kind of guy. God wants that guy and a guy to face the correction until he repents and starts to live in a way that honors his wife. Because he gave this wife, his daughter, and she's the waker vessel, he should be protecting, he should be loving, he should be guarding, he should be washing her with the word, he should be leading her as a servant leader for her benefit, getting her ready to meet Jesus, right? And so what happens is in this, that we need to have honor in our marriages, and that honor really should stand out. In a crazy world, people should see Christian marriages and say, man, this world's crazy, but Man, their marriage, they're happy and they're, they're blessed and they're in unity and they, they love the Lord and they love one another. And they should look at us and say, man, I guess that's what honor looks like. They see wives who aren't preaching at their husbands, but rather they're following and trusting God to direct through their husbands. And husbands that are loving their wives and honoring their wives and caring for their wives and leading their wives and, and directing their wives and encouraging their wives and loving on their wives and are kind and gentle and gracious like Christ. And so I want to tell you that it's super important that we really look at God's high calling for marriage. Because even the institution of marriage was what God instituted way back at creation. And his roles within marriage, while they're highly controversial today, haven't changed even in the smallest. You want to have a happy marriage? You want to have a marriage that glorifies God? You want God to have pleasure in your marriage? You want to find happiness and joy by in, in life and marriage, then you've got to tie into this idea of honoring one another. Not only wives honoring and submitting to the husband, it's not, it's not chauvinism where the man is dominating the woman. It's not feminism where the woman is dominating the man. It's following Christ where the man is leading out of love and out of a servant heart and out of kindness a wife who is following out of, out of a love for the Lord, a love for her husband, and both honoring the Lord, moving together in a, in a world that only knows chaos and division and separation and confusion when it comes to marriage. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us a blueprint for life. Ultimately, all this comes back to the gospel. Without being forgiven, having our eyes open to see the beauty of all that you've said and all that you've done, and to be able to follow your example, we would be at a loss and we would have nothing but confusion and trying to figure out on our own what all this looks like in our own ways. And none of those ways, it may seem right to a man, but it end is it leads to death 
But your way alone, Lord, is the way of peace, the, the path of life. It is the path leading us to the kingdom of God. It is a path of faith that we're believing your word, that we're believing that what you said is truthful, that it's always, it, it, it's always living, it's always active, it's always relevant, that it's as important for us to get and, and understand today as it was in Peter's day 2,000 years ago or in Daniel's day 2,500 years ago. Please, through your Holy Spirit, help us to, in our marriages to honor one another. Those who are not married yet, Lord, help them make wise choices about who to marry and then to, to 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 in their marriages to honor you and to honor one another we thank you lord in jesus name i pray amen